Hey, folks, uh, Miguel Roddy back here on the MMA Museum, and uh, we have another one of our deep dive interviews, and we have another one of our treat interviews where uh, we're over on the women's side of MMA, and we are, at this point, talking to a champion on the women's side of MMA. I'm joined by Julia Budd. Uh, Julia, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm very glad to meet you uh, for the first time. I'm grateful to your husband, Lance Gibson, for setting up the interview for us. Uh, Lance put in a good word for me. I know you wouldn't, you don't do these kind of things, you know, meet guys on the internet. <laughs> so um, I appreciate it. Um, all kidding aside, um, you're a very, very serious martial artist. Um, you started out, I, I'm not sure what year, but you started out in the kickboxing world when you were very young, probably about 20 years old, I'm guessing. Uh, do you remember yeah. your first kickboxing uh, fight? I do. I do. I started in Vancouver. Um, my first kickboxing fight was uh, um, right in Vancouver at somebody's gym. And okay. then from there, I went to the States and ended up fighting in, in kickboxing. So Okay. Now, I've got uh, a name. Danielle Kui appears to be your first match. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, do you do you remember the date of that? Because they don't have a date yeah. on the internet for a handful of these yeah. Vancouver fights. Uh, yeah, I think it was uh July in two thousand three. Okay. Yeah, two thousand three. Oh no, two. Yeah, two thousand three. I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. So, so, so how did you get there? Uh, what you know, you you're yeah. obviously did you go to college? Were you an athlete in school? Um, combat sports, you know, Lance is a little bit of a brawler on the streets kind of thing. I'm, most women take a different path, <laughs> MMA, unless, uh, unless you're a wild Canadian. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I liked fighting too when I was younger, but like, okay. um, basically I got introduced. So I come from a really small town in BC. Uh, it's called the Sunshine Coast. I grew up in Seashell and, uh, a kickboxing instructor moved up here and he actually trained with Lance in Vancouver. Okay. And so he would bring us in on like Saturdays, we'd get to go in and I was in grade like 10 or grade 11 and we'd go in and spar in the city and go to like, be, yeah, um, we go and spar. And then I, so that's how I met him. And then my first kickboxing fight, I don't even know if I'd ever sparred before my first fight. Um, it was just like, oh, they need a girl at your weight side, at your weight. So do you want to get in there and fight? So I was like, of course, let's go. Um, and then I ended up losing because I just completely gassed out. I never even knew what it felt like to be in there. And I was like, I gassed out. And then I just was like, but I was hooked. It was weird. It was like, okay, I want to do this. I want to like try getting conditioned for this and do it again. And then I ended up going down to like Tequila right outside of um, Washington and, or in Washington, sorry, right outside of Seattle and had my next fight like six months later. And yeah, then from then it's all just like, I was, I knew it was for me. Yeah, you 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 logged a lot of fights, so we're we're at the very beginning. So now, when you were a kid in school, uh, were you a troublemaker? Did you get in a lot of fights, or did you do you have some bouncing in your background, or you said you like fights, or or, or was that watching yeah. fights with your dad? Talk to us. Yeah, like it's kind of funny to talk about it now, but like see, we so on the Sunshine Coast, there's like Gibsons and Seashell, and I would end up fighting girls from Gibsons um when we go out like on friday saturday night it would be like i don't know the girls from seashell didn't like the girls from gibson's and vice versa and then we'd end up getting into like little fights or my friends would end up getting into fights and then i'd step in and yeah so i kind of started that way that's how i first got involved and then i was like okay no i need to if i'm gonna keep doing this i need to actually like not be doing this like this so Okay, yeah. but those were were those like semi organized fights, or are you talking no, about just no. fighting those at the, like, at the those bar? Were like I think drunk, kind of like uh, fights at parties. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's that's cool. Now yeah. we already we already set the tone here. There now a lot of the yeah. girls um, that do MMA, you know, they yeah. came up they came up with some of that. I, do you know Shane yeah. Basler? At least yeah. by name. Okay, so. Shane has some wild stories from South Dakota too, where they fought <laughs> surrounded by cars with the light beams yeah. providing the light okay. and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, yeah. so um so for sure, okay, that's cool. So you um you consider that helps you once you start to get into the ring that you you know had a little bit of way around yourself. Lance loved, you know, he liked the brawl in the street kind of thing, and he thought yeah. that 
that kept them, you know, collected during, uh, you know, competition time. Other people maybe <laughs> feel like, okay, you know, on the street, it's kind of freelance or whatever. And the competition makes them nervous. How, how did you adapt to it? Did you like it? I like it. I think I've just always like, I'm an adrenaline seeker and, um, yeah, I always, I've, I think it definitely helps cause it's like you, uh, you, I like to fight. So I just like, it helped me. And then I was like, Oh, I could, I never knew that when I got into this, it would actually turn into a career. It was also like, it was like, I convinced my parents to like pay for my martial arts membership while I went to university. And that's actually where I went. I, I joined, uh, Lance's gym when I was going to university down in at UBC in okay. uh, Vancouver and so I I was like okay and they were like if, if this is a long trek because it was like a couple hours it would take me to get on like buses and sky trains and stuff to get to the gym and she, they're like if your grades like if you start doing bad at school like you're uh, we're not paying for the gym membership anymore and I just it yeah I made sure I kept my academics up and okay. trained every night and okay. uh, that's kind of Okay, yeah. and so your parents kind of, you, you could say they sponsored you, they backed you on this. Yeah, they okay. totally they backed me 100%. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Uh, yeah. Another journey, you know, Roxanne Modafferi. Yep. She, you know, kind of did it on the sly. Her parents were sort of against it, didn't like it. So, <laughs> Uh, very oh, no interesting. <laughs> so, uh, so that's cool. I think uh, that it's good to have the family backing now. Mm -hmm. So you're going through a few fights now. You said you lost your first fight. You gassed out, mm -hmm. but then you got right into the swing of things, and it looks like at least four or five fights in the Vancouver area you won right in a row. Um, talk mm -hmm. about that experience and and what the level was like. Were, were those still gym fights, or was there anything in a little big bigger arena or anything like that? Um, no, they got to be pretty like, well, they were big for me. Uh, they were like, at, uh, I remember, um, my first, uh, fight was like at like, uh, the Croatian cultural center title okay. fights, kickboxing, Muay Thai fights, kind of like all over Vancouver. And, um, and then I got going into the U S so, um, yeah, basically it was, it, they were bigger than gym fights, but, um, yeah, they were like the local ones and then they kind of got got yeah, my it, confidence going for got my confidence going so that when i went to you know i think my first fight um i'm gonna get to it I'm yeah gonna get to okay. It. <laughs> okay but yeah. so just for people to place it that croatian uh cultural center might sound yeah. small but it is kind of a venue like they do like heavy metal concerts and stuff like that so yeah. it is more of like yeah. you know so there were tickets sold in other words yeah oh okay. totally and then and then in north van as well like it was on the reservation there but those were big, like those, those felt big to me. I mean, okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. And did you like it fighting in front of people? Yeah. Like, you, you, so you started to yeah. get the, the, the adrenaline always um, yeah. kicked in from the beginning. So now yeah. <laughs> the reason I wanted to, uh, I, I, I cut you off a little bit there is because according to the internet and you have a, a career where you've literally fought like the top women in the world, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> like at least at least five of them that at one point were the best women in the world. You've definitely fought with and done very well with. The mm -hmm. first one that comes up, um, she was really one of the first big names, and she also came from uh, uh, kickboxing background, as far as we know. And th then she got sponsored in the Strike Force shows. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about Gina Carano. Now, I think, mm -hmm. you know, she was in Hollywood and one of the Star Wars shows for a little bit. I know through Lance, you guys know all about movies and stuff like that as well. But yeah. Talk about uh, facing Gina Carano because Gina was a big deal in, in 2007 when you met her. Um, and, yeah. you you know, you were still coming up from the local circuit. So were you bought in to lose? What, what, what was your whole feeling yeah. of that fight? Talk about that. Yeah, like I, I got brought in to lose for sure. But somebody had bit that had been um, at one of my kickboxing fights, uh, I guess they got the call and then called us and said like, hey, they need a 145-er. Because um, the 145 division, it just was hard to find girls our size, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got the call on like a couple weeks notice to go down to Vegas and fight Gina in Muay Thai. And, I, and at this point, I'd never done Muay Thai before, so... I wasn't even like, I knew there was like elbows and knees and everything, but I'd done kickboxing and 
um, when we got down there, then they're like, okay, it's like longer rounds. It's not two minute rounds. It was like three minute rounds, I think. And uh, elbows. And I was like, okay, whoa. Like, but I wasn't, I wasn't worried. I was like, I was really confident in my training and I was ready to go. So I knew they would brought me in kind of expecting me to lose. And I was like, oh no, like I was, <laughs> I was ready. I, I was like waiting for this opportunity. So. Okay. How did, how was uh, the, the show? Where, what venue was it in? Oh, it was awesome. It was at the Stardust and okay. uh, it was one of the master Toddy's shows. And it was like, my mom and dad came and I think my grandma came from like Toronto and they came down to support me. And it was just, it felt like a huge deal, just Las Vegas style. So it's like, it just felt like a big step up for me um, from coming from Vancouver. And uh, yeah, it was awesome. It was an awesome experience. Cool. cool. Okay. Here, here's, here's the question. So <laughs> what was Gina like? Was she like, kind of like the star and snobbish or was she nice to you? Cause the women seem to have a camaraderie usually. Yeah. You know what? I think it was, it was she, like, I was there for business. Like I was, I was probably the one that was like, wait, like I was there to, I was like, Oh, I'm here to prove myself. So I think she was really friendly actually at the way in. And I, and I was like, Oh no, I like let her know with my, I was like ready to go at the way. And I just remember, it was a long time ago now, but I remember being like, I was probably the one that was a bit more standoffish, Game but face. she was like, I also didn't know much of her history. So people, I couldn't really understand because everyone was like, oh, like, you sure you're ready to fight Gina? Like when I got down there and I was like, yeah, what are you talking about? But she was already 10 and 0 and I don't think I like really uh, had given it much. Like I didn't, I didn't really pay attention to her, like her knocking people out and any of that. I just like... But I just believed in my skills and I kind of didn't give it any, uh, I didn't give it, I didn't give a damn. I was okay, like, oh, you you a, thought you yeah. were going to win. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, a, really like, a terrific done. mindset to have, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, you beat her. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I remember it, I stopped her in the third. I remember the ref looking at me. Cause I like, I heard her with a kick to the body. I think it was a left body kick in the first round. And she just like almost went down, like almost like an eight count. Like, and I remember the ref being like, like, cause she kind of like got up and I still gave her extra time. And the ref was like looking at me and I just, I was so early in my career. I didn't know you could like attack or any of that. So I like, kind of like, was like, let's start. Like I stood back and let her kind of recover. And I remember afterwards learning like, oh no, like after, if they get back up, that's like, you can attack and finish the fight there. But like, I didn't even know that at that point. Okay. So <laughs> who, who accompanied you besides your family and stuff? Like, like were you with Lance or other? Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. I was just with Lance. And then one other fighter, a guy named Cameron Brown, who's like, a, got brought in as a heavyweight and fought one of Master Toddy's heavyweight fighters. Okay. So I was kind of in the back by myself. There was one other coach that was there with, uh, a girl fighting because there was like it was really cool like master toddy had like a a big girls like a lot of like famous girl um fighters so um they were back there in the change room with me and stuff but when um i was back there alone for part of it because um cameron fought right before me okay okay so the training you know at this point you're you're active now you're traveling for a fight but you've been training with lance and and lance goes back to the mid 90s with real pro people like you know Hume and those guys had you yeah. trained at any point with Matt Hume gone down there or were you just getting it from Lance you know kind of like just training with Lance like I've been yeah I've been training with him and then my other coach um one of his students they were my my coaches the whole way through yeah, I do you, you Ryan Diaz perhaps yeah yeah uh, okay. Ryan Ryan was there at the gym at that point um Gabriel Ostovic was my my coach on the Sunshine Coast that brought me to Lance. Okay. And yeah, and then Okay. I know of... Ryan I match made a lot for Ryan. A couple at least oh, a yeah. couple of fights. Yeah, I think he held one of our belts at Hook and Shoot. Um, okay, yeah. It, I remember that was like a big he was one of the big fighters. Like Lance had a a bunch of fighters at the time. So it was like the biggest gym in Vancouver. And that's one of the reasons we were all coming to him. We we're like, holy, like he's got cool. guys on the big show and yeah. So cool, cool. So okay, so you know, you came, you you got the job done against Gina Carano. That's a good thing. Now she hadn't broken into MMA yet either. If she was doing Muay Thai, mm -hmm. but that push would come a little later. I guess yeah. uh, she would qualify you as a stumbling block, and 
At least in <laughs> MMA, she stayed away from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, as yeah. you continue here, um, you went ahead and you could you went back to Canada. You fought uh, a few times. Uh, you went to Calgary and fought uh, somebody named Kerry mm -hmm. Scar. I'm not mm -hmm. greatly familiar with a lot of the uh, kickboxing names. And then towards the end of your kickboxing run, you went, um, it looks like you may have done some type of uh, uh, dual trips, two trips down to Florida for something called the Kumite. What What was yep. that about? What Talk about that, uh, you know, a experience. Well, that guy was actually like a crook, and I don't think he paid any of the fighters. So we were like, um, <laughs> I, I think that like we had to like threaten him and get his like a, me and a bunch of the fighters never got paid. It was like 300 bucks or something. But you know, at the time it was, it was more about the principle. And yeah. uh, I remember we were like super upset, but the experience was great. Cause I fought some really, I actually fought like some really tough girls there. Um, Natalie Foos, who is from like New York and she was a champion Muay Thai fighter and then another girl from Colorado that was super tough. So those were two tough opponents that I was like, it was, again, good for my career. But, yeah, the guy was a bit of a crook. Chrisanne Roselip? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So let me ask you. So the guy, so you come in, you fight, you don't get paid. No. And you go back and fight again there. What, 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 what no, is that? no, I the first time we did get paid okay. so the okay. second time it was the last time and i think lance threatened him and we ended up getting like the 300 bucks from him or whatever but yeah, yeah. It's, it's probably it smart on his part to, to pay <laughs> because i always wonder about that you know i'm, I'm i've been in the game <laughs> and it's like you know if, if these guys get mad at me there's not you know i i, I, <laughs> I mean it's better to pay i think <laughs> yeah same thing, even yeah, going, it'd be worse to be beat up by a woman, I guess, you know, but uh, it, it, it would happen in these cases. So, um, unbelievable. Um, that always runs into it's one of our questions that we like to ask is, Have you ever been ripped off by a promoter? So, you, you got that yeah. out of the way early. <laughs> yeah. Um, now for kickboxing, anyway, um, you, you go on a journey, you take mm -hmm. that kind of big trip, and you actually get a fight in in thailand um mm -hmm. again against a thai girl it looks like uh i only have a name that says nop so i yeah, guess that may have yeah. been her nickname and stuff um it but, was it, it was and and um well she it was like it was um i think that i had like five different opponents and that whole week i was there in thailand it kept getting switched like different opponent different opponent different opponent um and then yeah i ended up getting a knockout i think by uh, like elbows okay but again i was like I, and that i actually made money there i didn't even know i was gonna get paid to do that i was like i didn't okay. know we were getting paid but yeah okay Anyways. well that's that's cool now that's a good thing now um what do you think going to thailand because a lot of the guys always they go over there and you know for the training and the mm -hmm. ties are you know a different level in kickboxing <laughs> especially at their muay thai um what are the women like? Or do you, or did you see like, you know, like, uh, I think I was a little women? bit, well, the, the, I don't, it's hard to say there wasn't that again, my, I was, um, when I went, so this is like the end of 07, we went down, the training was awesome. I loved the training and the food and everything, the whole, everything was so cool. And it was so cool to go down there and like, uh the the warm-up was like getting a massage i remember they were like tie liniment all over your whole body and then go out there and i had no idea who i was fighting so it was just that experience of like having no idea when you get in there who it is or like who the person you're fighting is and so that was pretty cool um but yeah it was a good experience i think overall because it was like i felt nervous there more nervous there because i think i was there was so much like unknown i always knew who my opponent was or like but yeah and, and I remember so, feeling more nervous for that fight. <laughs> and, and, and at 145, you can probably say that um, they there, are, there aren't a lot of Thai girls at that level, no. all right? No. So did you no. see any little ones that are killers? I saw little, like, kids that were killers, like, that I was shocked by. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. And it's such a lifestyle there. Like, uh, I was impressed by all the the skill, basically, of all the younger younger people. And um, some of the guys, some of the fights were amazing. Yeah, it was a yeah, cool experience. It's a it's a lifestyle. It's a culture yeah. for sure. Yeah. So now you've got you've done the Thailand thing. 
now you come back and you close out your uh, kickboxing career. You started out with a little bit of a loss, and then you close it out with a little bit of a loss. You take a trip to Holland, but this is a familiar name also to MMA people, and, and you'd meet her later again. This is, a, uh, I may mispronounce it, Jermaine Durandini. Yep. <laughs> so what do you remember about the trip to Holland, another kind of mecca for kickboxers, you know? Well, what was your well, experience going there? The, the, but the Dutch could be kind of dirty too, kind of double cross. That, kind of, that was what happened to me. Was okay. So the f- title, the fight was set at one forty-five, and I had my like heart set on fighting her because she was just like you know I don't even know what her kickboxing record was like fifty and zero or something. She was amazing. Fought men, beat men. I kind of like heard about her my whole career. Really wanted to fight her. I get over there and I think they like, okay, so the maybe two days before we flew out, they told me I had to make 140 or she wasn't fighting. Okay. So I was like, what? And they, we were flying in on like, I think the fight was on the Saturday. It's the time difference, whatever. They had us flying in on like Wednesday. So I didn't get in until Thursday. And it was just a hell of a cut. I ended up making the weight, but I was like, I was like dead. It was the, it was, it was so bad. So I make 140 and I just remember, um, I think I got knocked out, uh, first round. It was a knockout, but it was like, I was not even like, it felt like I was not even in my body. If that makes sense. I was like, so out of it. Yeah. And so I was really pissed off after that fight, but yeah, I mean, no. it's a learning experience too. It's like, Oh, she, Jermaine doesn't won't fight. I got there. I start to warm up. They said, you're fighting now. I wasn't supposed to be fighting till like the end of the night you're fighting before the intermission and i was like oh my so it was just this like whole mind game like for, yeah. yeah it was shitty but yeah i and got her top- back and- <laughs> <laughs> yes you did that but on top of that you know the the rough part and you learn as a pro for the trips too but you probably got on a plane eight in the evening nine in the evening and then yeah. and you arrive there probably between five and eight in the morning yeah um, so and, it, and then it- Cut, like the cut so that we get there on the Thursday and then the weigh-ins the Friday morning so yeah. it was just like and I remember I left here at like 150 so I'm like okay my weight's gonna be good but that's still like I was already super depleted and uh okay yeah yeah okay so you played their game you went to their hometown she got another win and uh we'll hear yeah. her name again you made you into obviously you've been with Lance where did you guys get married we ended up getting married in 2013 in Cuba. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, that sounds like a, a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, so you, you have you been dating, or was he just a coach before, like during these kickboxing? At matches? this point, we were friends for years, but we were dating by this point. Okay, and and in how the- did he influence you to go to MMA? What what, what how did, how was that whole decision made? Because you had a, a decent career in kickboxing. Was it partially financial? No, I didn't want to fight. Actually, I was like, I'm good. I'm running the gym, and um, I was. I wanted to retire. I think I was so kind of just pissed off about the that that whole experience. Um, the cutting weight. I was like, whatever. I'm done. I'll coach other people. I was coaching, and then he ended up meeting Rampage on the set of the A Team. Okay. In Vancouver, I think A Team was filmed in Vancouver, and so they started training, and then Lance ended up going to. Uh, uh england to train him for uh the rashad fight so lance was over there when he, we ca- he came back he got the fight against Leota machida and lance was like okay uh do you want to drive me down to to california and kind of like uh drop me off or whatever and i so i me lance and junior drove down i was gonna drop him off in california and when i was down there he got a call from bob cook that was looking for a 145er for MMA and I, and I remember we were dro- we were like I don't know what we were doing but it was him and Rampage and Lance was like they need a 145er for MMA I was like hell no like I I'm not fighting I don't want it like I haven't wrestled like I I don't even know the ground like forget it and um they both were kind of like yeah well I I would do it like it's in California you're already here you know you're already here you're already you're gonna drop me off like why why don't you do it it's in like i think it was like four or five weeks um so i was like i got kind of convinced to do it and he's like if you hate it and you don't like it you never have to do it again but i think it's a opportunity like 
go for it. And so I did. And then the rest is That's history, funny. I guess. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. The little coincidence is probably yeah. in the next five interviews, I'm going to interview the man called Crazy Bob Cook. So yeah. I, I, yeah, I know okay, exactly cool. who you're talking about. He's a wild man. Um, yeah. Very interesting and, and, and a genius at this stuff. Um, well, and he ended up, I think he was the matchmaker for Strike Force for like my next four, my whole Strike Force career. I think he was the matchmaker. So. Aha. Uh -huh. I taught him everything he knows. You can tell him I said that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, no, Bob's a good guy. And um, definitely he was always around good people and he would treat you pretty well too. I think there you didn't have to win with Strike Force yeah. and, and Coker. I think Lance probably knew Coker even you know, before that time period. And uh, you probably yeah. were treated pretty well. Yes. That was like, it was like I was in, all of a sudden, you know, a pro MMA fighter out of nowhere. That's what it felt like. I was like, kickboxing was completely a different story. And then MMA, it was like, right away, I was kind of in the big leagues, I guess. And yeah. no amateur career. <laughs> yeah. And those strike force shows by then, 2010 time period, that, that was mm -hmm. the televised shows. And yeah. things like that. So let's get into this uh, first fight. So what did Crazy Bob do to you? So somebody named Shana Nelson, but I think mm -hmm. she was a late replacement. Um, at some point, things got switched around. Let me look here. Oh, I no, was no. The, okay, you were the late replacement. Yeah, okay. I think I was the late replacement. I don't know if she was supposed to fight Cyborg already or what, but. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how did that first match, what, what do you remember about, about that? Were you able to keep it on your feet? And how was the yeah. crash course on the on the ground fighting those five weeks, what would you? What'd it was you great. I, I mean, I trained my butt off. I trained, I did like whatever Rampage was doing for his Machida camp. So I was training at that, like that level, I think, like okay. not knowing it. I was just training three times a day. And um, yeah, I was able to like learn some takedown defense. <laughs> and that was pretty much it. Just like get, and if it does hit the ground, get off your back and get yeah. to a good position. That was basically my mentality going into that fight. Right. And that's how a lot of kickboxes start. It's like, don't go to yeah. the ground. If you go to the ground, work to get back up. You know, that, yeah. that's kind of the basics of it. And, and let your hands go because your your hands and your feet should be better than them. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you had a good strategy. You had good people around you. Um, you already had that competitor's mindset. Um, so you came out and you won your debut fight, which uh, is a good feeling. Now, you stick with Strike Force. And then, you know, I don't think she was the GOAT yet, but <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. next match up, you 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 wind up facing Amanda Nunez. Mm -hmm. So what was this experience like? Because Amanda's, you know, she had the long run with the UFC champion. Some people consider her the GOAT on the women's side. Um, yeah. She's a, she's a pretty damn good fighter. Talk, talk about that fight and talk about the buildup for that and, and, and what was going on there. Yeah, I just, so I ended up fighting like her, I think it was like two or three months after my first fight. And I just think that you kind of, well, I learned an important lesson, obviously. Um, she hit like a ton of bricks. Like I remember being like, holy smokes, I've never been hit like that before. But uh, you can't go into every fight with the same strategy. I was like, duh. But yeah, I, <laughs> I, I went into that not like I was just like I'm just gonna kick this girl's ass just like I kicked the last girl's ass and it's gonna be like easy and I think I just assumed that um up until that point I was like I thought it was like a one strategy for all kind of thing and it was I it was it was too soon after my first fight to really clue in about like I think I was still celebrating my first fight in a way yeah, and, and, yeah, for sure. You you yeah. fought in October, um, mid October, yeah. <laughs> and then this was January seventh. Uh, so yeah, you know, yeah, and I, I was still riding high from that first fight, and I was just like, whoop, thrown right in there. And then, um, so I ended up losing to her, but it it just like it it was like uh, it again. It was like I'm definitely not quitting after this one. Not okay. going out like this. So, uh, but it taught me so many valuable lessons because I was like, yeah, okay. every fight's different. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. Now, let me ask you. So this fight was on a January 7th of 2011. Mm -hmm. Did you train through Thanksgiving and the holidays or did you, you did your normal no, holidays? That's, and stuff, I, so that's part of the problem too. That. 
I was still celebrating. I was like, you know what? Uh, it's going to be, I, I totally underestimated her, even though I was like, afterwards, again, it was like, I just underestimated her and didn't think that it was, she was as good as she was. I think she was coming on like five KOs. Like I should have like paid attention, but I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I just knew, thought that I was just going to, the first fight was pretty easy. And I was like, it's still, yeah. Okay. Again, the, a little yeah. humble pie. No, that, and that's good because, you, you know, you don't get to the heights that you did get later without, you know, yeah. recognizing some of the things that you're, you're you're pointing out here along the line. So it's important yeah. to see your journey here. Um, so we had Gina. You know, Jermaine would have to qualify on the MM, on the uh, kickboxing side as one of those elite girls. Now we have Amanda mm -hmm. Nunez. So you can see that the resume is starting to get packed already here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your third fight in MMA um, – the strike force show uh went up to your neck of the woods and it was in the washington state and they mm -hmm. brought in jermaine uh, to fight you so you got to do a little bit of revenge and she was probably early in her mma career as well we later saw her obviously i think uh, in the ufc and things like that but uh, uh so talk about the whole build up to this match did you ask for her to be brought in was you know what what, what was the deal there did you know obviously it was motivational for you to get her back well, and, and so that was the thing is I, so I lose to Amanda. I'm knocked out by Amanda in like 15 seconds, 14 seconds. And then I'm, I'm kind of like, obviously like going through that whole, like what you, what happens when a fighter goes through getting knocked out, you're like questioning, oh man, like all okay. this stuff. And we get a call that's like, uh, we want you to fight Jermaine Randomy. And, and I was like, ah, no way. Like I'm not fighting another, like she's a better striker than Amanda. I don't want to, I'm not ready. I don't want to do this, blah, 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 blah. And that was, again, Lance was like, okay, if you're scared, I'll just tell them you're too scared to fight. <laughs> and that's, that's how our, like he is as a coach. Like, you know, yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> I was like, Oh my God. Like, what the fuck? Like, I, I remember getting so mad. I was like, I'm not scared. And then I'm like, that's exactly what I am. I am scared. Like I'm, she knocked me out in kickboxing. I'm coming off a knockout loss in from Amanda and, um, I don't want to do this. And it's in my, it's in like my hometown, basically like everybody's going to be there. So I was really nervous, but it, I was like, okay, I'm going to go in there and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to train my ass off. So that was like, I trained so hard for that. And I think it, it was like, she underestimated me because she had beat me so easily in kickboxing. I think she just totally underestimated me and, and I kind of, yeah, I was able to beat her. So good. Now you can tell, you know, Lance, you, you, know, you watch our <laughs> interview. Lance is a great guy. He's a good guy. Obviously, you married him, so you think so too. Um, yeah. But he can be ruthless. You know, it's very, yeah. it's okay to be scared. Yeah. But to yeah. tell the promoter you're scared. There's no need yeah. for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, Bob, I'm going to call Bob right now, and I'm going to tell him you're too scared to fight her. Uh, and then we'll just like <laughs> that's it. Like you're, you know, we'll see if you ever fight again. And I remember being like. But I had enough time to like wrap my head around. I think I went for a walk, cooled off, and I'm like, okay, I'll do it. And then, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that's where your adrenaline, your your competitive nature that, that popped up early, uh, kind of saved the day there. Now, yeah. Strike Strike Force <laughs> didn't stop throwing the the big names at you because in your next fight, uh, we talked about Amanda as the goat. If Amanda's not the goat, maybe Ronda Rousey is because that's who you fought next. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. she was at this point, uh, not in the UFC, but already she was starting to be on her run. And she's another one of those, um, people that bring an attitude and stuff like that. So talk about the whole package of, of facing Rhonda, dealing with, with her and, and her persona and everything. Um, well, I think that it was just like, after I beat uh, Jermaine, I was like, I got given the total opposite. Like, okay, this girl's like a ground specialist. And it was the first time in my career I fought somebody that was like that good at the, at the ground. And I think in that one, the interviews before kind of pissed me off. Like, yeah, she was already talking a lot and I was a little bit pissed off going into that. So it added to extra motivation to train. But again, it was so early in my career. It was like, this all happened within a year, I think, of me, like, fighting. So it was, like, I fought all four fights in the first year of my career. And, uh, yeah, I got in there. She ended up arm barring me. But, again, it was, like, 
I, it motivated me and I came back to win, but yeah, it kind of was, it was, it was still like a, a piss me off. <laughs> See, now, now with Lance in his group, Lance, uh, you mm -hmm. know, coming, being taught by Hume and those guys and then Lance, you know, guys like Ryan and stuff, they're great ground fighters. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Were you, were you kind of, you said you were still relying on your kickboxing at this point, or was it just not enough time for you to soak it all in? I think it was not enough time to soak it all in. And just like certain things like, Oh, distance management, like those kind of things. Like those are just like, Oh, take down. Okay. I can st like chain wrestling. Yeah. Like, I think it was like these kind of things that come as you get better and more time under your belt. But I was just like, it was just like, I, I, I think it was just too many things to learn, if that makes sense, like in that sure. first year. Um, sure. But and you, and you might I'm know like, them, but to put them yeah. in effect. Yeah, you're like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And, you, and as we've covered here, you're doing it against the elite girls. And, um, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're still uh, being called by promoters. But Strike Force kind of goes down uh, at this point. They, I believe, got purchased by the UFC. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and supposedly, if I remember correctly, the deal was that they didn't buy, you know, the name or anything like that. Like they did some shows with WEC where WEC kept the name and they were still owned by UFC for a little while, but they bought the contract. So, were you ever in the UFC mix, or were you between uh, contracts? No. Okay, so the UFC, the Strike Force was owned from UFC for my last two fights, so Jermaine and Ronda. And I think that what they did is they just, I mean, I don't even know. I just remember getting like a release paper from UFC right after I lost to Ronda. Uh, and so, yeah, I remember getting a release paper because I couldn't make 135. I think they were like, yeah. if, you're, if you can make this weight class, then we'll keep the girls that can make 135 on. Um, I couldn't. So I was like, I, I was released. And then I was, I was, uh, yeah. I remember I got released, but it was definitely, they owned it already from Jermaine because I went to some UFC thing before that fight. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So at this point, they, I remember that they, you're right. They were doing the 135 and 115. They had yeah. skipped to 125 and, and then they weren't even considering 145. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So, so um, then yeah. how'd you feel about that? Because you know, for some oh, of the people going over there, it's like the big show, and now you really could think of this as a career. And now you fall back to go to Invicta. Did you have some kind of motivation, resentment? Well, talk about how that felt. I think it was just like, I think it was just like I was excited about gonna be that that I was gonna be a part of the UFC, and then I got my like right after my arm started to heal because I think it like it was broken and torn, and it took like six or eight weeks to heal my arm to even be able to do anything. So I was like, I I remember I got just got healed up, and I'm like, awesome, it's Christmas time, and then I got the release papers that was like, yeah, you're you're not gonna be able to stay. We're not keeping you with UFC. So I was kind of upset, and then. Anyways, I got I, Invicta was just taking off, I believe, and I was yeah. like, okay, we'll contact them. And it was actually a really cool show. Like when I, I wasn't, I wasn't like, it didn't feel like a downgrade. If that makes sense. I felt yeah. like, oh, this is cool what they're doing for women's MMA, sure. and uh, cool to be a part of. And and yeah. then that's kind of I think I had four fights with them. Yeah. Now Invicta came out with heavy. Um you know, production value and stuff like that, especially <laughs> in the very beginning and stuff. So for sure, yeah. um, it's good that you were able to stay motivated and, and do that. Now, with Strike Force, at the end of the day, uh, you, since you fought Nunez and Rousey, you, you came out there with a two and two record. You mm -hmm. said you had four fights in Invicta and you ran the table, you went four and oh. Um, let's, yeah. talk, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that because now you're actually beginning to come into your own. First of all, all the fights were in Kansas City. Was that the, the Invictus home base and yeah, what, what, what was that like? What was the treatment there? Because Kansas City would <laughs> qualify probably as a you know a secondary venue. It's not Vegas, you know what I mean. It would do no. respect to it. So, well, what were your yeah. thoughts? Did you did you enjoy them? What, what did you I get to make really, it? Go ahead. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a cool venue. Like, I I don't know if they were all at this place, but it was like almost like a just a very old building that kind of felt. Uh, it was just had a cool vibe to it. Okay, and I remember going in. 
like, okay, this is, this is awesome. And um, yeah, I, I loved it. I, I loved it. And it also just like, it allowed me to kind of like, I felt like I was becoming a more complete mixed martial artist at that point in my career. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm learning. I'm more comfortable on the ground I'm more comfortable with my wrestling and, um, and then also my striking. So it just, yeah, it had yeah. a good feeling the way through. Good, good. So now it was eight months from the Rousey fight till your debut with Invicta. Mm -hmm. So you got some time to heal and also some time to get the training cinched in. You you fought yeah. in your debut, you fought Al Alina Nel Nelson. Um, mm -hmm. What do you remember about the Invicta debut? Well, uh, she was a Muay Thai girl as well. So um, we kind of both had similar backgrounds. And um, I think what it kind of showed me, <clears throat> I was able to show my wrestling. So I ended up shooting like a awesome double leg and I was like, oh my gosh, it was, it gave me like confidence in that area of my game. Um, being able to showcase my wrestling and my, I won by ground and pound and um, yeah, just showing, oh, I'm, I'm not just a Muay Thai fighter anymore. Okay, cool, cool. And so you're, you're back in the win column now mm -hmm. um, from July to October, just a, a handful, you know, three months or so you get Daniel <laughs> West. What, what do you uh, remember about Daniel West's fight? Well, she was a last minute replacement. I was training to fight. Um, what's her name? A uh, kickboxer from California who was like a really good Muay Thai fighter. Um, and so I was training to fight her for that whole camp. And then they. She ended up Maxwell? Getting yes. And she ended up getting injured. And so I ended up fighting Daniel West on like a week or two weeks notice or something like that. And, okay. Um, so, yeah, I ended okay. up finishing her first round, too. Um, okay. Yeah. So, the, so that's good, and you know, you're you're getting your feet wet now. You're you're two zero with a, a new flag, the Invicta flag. Now you're mm -hmm. obviously starting to feel you're on top of the rankings and that sort of stuff. And then it looks like there's a good six month layoff between that and your next fight. Why why so long a layoff? Um, I well, we that's when we got married. So uh -huh. and then it was like Christmas and stuff, and then um. Yeah, I think it was Christmas, and then I ended up fighting like in April or something like that. Okay, so I'm gonna we're gonna take a, a little segue. So tell me a little bit about Cuba, because as as Americans, Cuba is very mysterious to Americans, but Canadians <laughs> can can go there on vacation. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so um, it, it's a beautiful place. What was the treatment like, and did you get to see any boxing or anything? Because they do have some there. Yeah, no, I never actually got to see any boxing. I think we went by one of the boxing gyms when we were there but um no it was just really cool awesome uh the beaches the food the people were amazing um and my whole family like I've got a lot of family that are in Toronto and that that's like their I, I don't know like couple hour flight for them so they were all able to come and join us so we had like I think like 55 people-ish there for the wedding wow. and the beach and awesome. yeah it was cool yeah that's definitely a nice experience yeah I I my yeah. um my brother's married to a girl whose family's from Cuba. So okay, cool. that's why I, I wanted to ask, <laughs> but that's cool. I'm, I'm glad Lance didn't drag you to the gym every day there because you know, yeah. that, that wouldn't have been fair either. Um, I'm, I'm so. glad you had a good time, but you did come back. And so it's yeah. April, 2013 and you fight yeah. Molly Estes. And yeah. this is notable for a couple of reasons. This one, uh, she got you into the third round. But this mm -hmm. one, I think, is uh, your first submission victory. So talk, yeah. talk about this this match and, and what your memories are of Molly. Oh, man. I think this was also like a weird opponent switch up. So I think this was like Cyborg was back in or signed with Invicta as well at this point. Okay. And um, they gave my opponent that I was preparing for to Cyborg. Is that was reason. Eddie Ann Gomez? Yes. So I was preparing for her. Um, for that whole camp and then it was like the switch up kind of thing and um, so Molly was really strong and she was more of a grappler as well and um, the fight it was I think a lot on the ground I haven't really watched it in a long time but okay yeah I got up and like I think that's my only submission win in my whole career okay so <laughs> <laughs> that's okay it was an awesome experience but yeah I remember being like holy shit <laughs> You, you proved you could do it. You just haven't had to since then. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, and the next match now, Invicta, because at the end of the day, um, they are not a huge budget show. Um, there were mm -hmm. a lot of opponent switches and stuff. And it looks like the next fight 
was a lot about that as well. Was uh, you faced uh, Charmaine Tweet? Was yeah that also with some switches and things also? I don't think so. No, this one was with that, uh, which was big because she was a kickboxer from Canada as well. Okay, and wanted to fight me in kickboxing, but I was already done kickboxing. I was like, I'm not kickboxing again. So it was good, and she was um, she was just yeah, she's she was kind of those. Yeah, she she was an interesting opponent. She was really tall and big. So I, I was kind of like, I remember the weigh-in for that. She tried to tower over top of me and kind of like stick her nose in my face. And uh, there's just this photo of me like staring up at her. And I, <laughs> I was like, okay, like this girl's actually a really big girl. Like, holy crap. Because I usually felt like I was bigger. So sure. I remember that. And uh, that one, I, I, yeah, ended up winning that fight as well. Yep, so you, now you're 4-0 with Invicta. Now, as I said, uh, they're not a big budget show. They're trying to do the right thing for the women, and, and they really did do the right thing for the women, highlighting them, and, and they did all women's show for the people who may not remember Invicta or may not be following it at that level. But uh, from there, um, hats off to Scott Coker because he was mm -hmm. probably the strike force guy, and yep. that, now he's uh, probably – just about taking over the reins at Bellator or, or he's had maybe had them a little while, but he called you and you yeah. join the Bellator roster. Um, talk about that transition and, and the contract and what it was Coker that called you. Am I right? It was rich. Uh, oh, rich okay. too. So he called me. Um, I remember uh, I was going to fight for Invicta again. And uh, they ended up calling us in the summer and um, they signed me and Marlus Kunin to like to be the first girls at 145 for uh, well, it was Bellator was now being run by Scott Coker. So I was super excited about that. And um, yeah, I remember the phone call and being like, yeah, like, OK, like, what is this going to look like? And they were going to build the division and bring in the 145ers. And it was like it just felt like a lot of promise there. So. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And Bellator at this point, they, they, they were a company. Uh, they had switched um, ownership and, mm -hmm. and Coker had, had taken over the reins, but Coker, you know, a longtime veteran uh, running shows and things. So uh, they, they didn't really miss a beat. They had 130 shows. They were on television and uh, things like that. So it definitely had to feel like a step up from Invicta. Your, your first fight, you, you fought in Invicta. Um, December 7, 2013, and with all this transition stuff, you took 2014 off. Um, yeah. And then Bellator, uh, you, you come in in February of 2015 to Bellator 133 and face Gabrielle Holloway. Talk about how that felt after a year layoff and how big was Bellator compared to Invicta? Well, that was, so 2014, I took off and I was trying to make 135 and it was just kind of like, I was seeing like, okay, can I make 135 healthy? And it wasn't for me. And so when I got the call that they were going to do the 145 division, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. So my first fight, I was actually supposed to fight Lita Nogueira, who was like a jujitsu world champion. Um, she ended up getting injured like three weeks before. So they put Gabby Holloway in and I think she was like 10 and 0 at the time. And so again, a big switch up, but I was used to it from some of the er earlier stuff that I've been through my career. And so my Bellator debut, um, yeah, I ended up fighting her and it was a awesome fight. I, yeah, it was now, one of my, yeah, it was this, a definitely step up. <laughs> it, well, it had a feel that way. Cause I'm, I'm checking it out and you, you were, not just on the Bellator card. You were put on the main card, which aired on Spike TV. So you've got television mm -hmm. production and cameras everywhere and stuff like that. Yeah. Was that new or were you already used to some of that production stuff? No, that was totally new. Uh, well, I mean, besides my like strike force kind of time, um, it was definitely different than the, it felt bigger than uh, Invicta for sure. And okay. um yeah, and it was also, I think it was the first fight uh, for the girls, like uh, for their, yeah. So we were like the first kickoff fight for um, the the Bellator with Scott Coker. So. Yeah, and, and now with Strike Force, though, yes, they had big production value as well, but I don't think, you know, even though you fought some big names and stuff, they weren't featuring the women that highly 
like mm-hmm. like uh like Coker decided to do here because yeah. So you were on the main card. You felt he. I I feel he did a good job. Uh, you know, bringing the women along, kind of forcing the oh, UFC's right. hand. You know, mm-hmm. um, kind of not letting them take over. The you know you can't let Bellator take over. So the UFC had to take some action and, and move on and stuff because Bellator was pushing the envelope for sure. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. now let's take a look at this here. So you you now you're on a big win. You're you're on, you've won five in a row. And, you know, especially in women's MMA at the level that you've been fighting at, um, that's got to be notable. Uh, were you with a, a one fight deal at the beginning or were you signed to a, an extensive contract? What was what was all that? about? I think, I think it was a three fight deal. Um, and then I didn't fight again until the end of that year with them. And that was another switch up opponent. So I was supposed to fight Marlis Kunin for that fight. Yeah, she ended up getting injured, and then I ended up fighting a girl named Roberta Payne, who, uh, again, like I had no idea her style or anything against it, with her, and so I ended up um, fighting her, beating her, and then 2016 with um, I was supposed to fight. They wanted me to fight uh, Marlouse in 2016 for the title. And I ended up like herniating a bunch of discs in my low back. Yeah. 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 It looks like, so the R- Roberta fight was November of 2015 and you didn't return yeah. till October of 2016, 11 month layoff. And uh, they yeah. brought you back against Arlene Blencow. Also yeah. kind of a known quantity and tough. Um, what, what do you remember about your bounce back fight? And were you still, were you a little worried about the back injury? Cause the back injury yeah. I was really, I was, I was really worried about it because, um, I was scared. Like we kind of had a conversation in, like me and Lance were just talking in 2016 because when I hurt my back, I was just training with some bigger guys that were like really strong, good grapplers, and uh, I felt my back like, I don't even know, like, pop, 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 and then I, it just got worse and worse and worse, and I was completely like stuck, tilted to one way, and. <laughs> I couldn't walk for like five weeks. It was brutal. Like I had to lay with like my legs up and like get driven to and from chiropractors. And I remember talking and being like, maybe I shouldn't do this anymore. Cause like, if I can't walk properly, this is going to like affect my, like, I can't even like my daily life. Like I couldn't even like sit up for 15 minutes at a time kind of thing. And so I remember just being like, okay, they want to do surgery. I I didn't want to do surgery. I was like, I want to just try to do this as naturally as possible. See how I recover. But then when I, so then I started training again, just to see how I could train, obviously start out light. And that fight was probably a little bit early for my recovery. So I was worried about it going into that fight. Cause I was like, I hadn't wrestled at all. Hadn't been able to shoot any takedowns. It was really the grappling that was like really bad for my back. But yeah anyways it ended up going good i won and it and it solidified a title fight for the coming year so yep and now you know she's not as famous as ronda or uh amanda obviously because of the ufc um uh you know run that she had and stuff but another one of those gold qualifying names in my book is marlos conan yeah now yeah what was that like? And she's also like one of the like the opposite of Rhonda. She can now she's definitely a top shelf A competitor, but she's a nice yeah. She's a nice person to talk about the whole Merlos experience because you actually did break through and you won. And I think this was the first yeah. time that you fought into the fourth round in a title fight. So yeah. um, a lot of a lot of firsts here. And and again with with Merlos, uh, I consider her an all time great. So. Um, this mm-hmm. is a fantastic win, and this would have qualified as your tenth win in or eighth win in a row, a, a part of a long winning streak here. So, uh, yeah, what do you remember about Bellator one seventy four? Well, I remember that she had already had her victory. Uh, she like had rented out the whole uh, area, so like where the I remember being at the venue, uh, being there for fight week, and the elevators like right outside the elevators was like a club and it was already tied off for Marlos's like after party win. And uh. I, so I, in my mind, I'm like, wow, like she's already that confident that she's going to beat me. And I think it was like almost extra motive again, extra motivation that 
she was already gonna like her it was already roped off for her wind party and i remember thinking like oh hell no like and that wow. was just yeah anyways that was uh, one of the things that came up and said what do you remember about that but um for me it was like fighting uh somebody that i would like i had watched her fight and like looked up to her for a lot of my career because like some of her earlier fights like i remember her um strike force she was a strike force champ i think yeah and some of those fights were like blue like i was they were just amazing fights and i so she was one of those people that i like had watched and really looked up to and so yeah when she fought um when we when i found out i was fighting her for the title it was like just a little bit of extra fire to you know yeah yeah you know what's amazing about merlos and a lot of people may not be aware of this is she fought in the 90s she fought uh, Becky Levi, who was like Dan Severn's tra training partner, you know, um, and uh, she did that in Japan in a tournament. Get this in the 90s, in that tournament that she won in Japan, she made a hundred thousand dollars. Oh so, my god, yeah, so, yeah, because a lot of people are like, Yeah, we're, we're doing it back then for like 200 bucks, 300 bucks, but in Japan, she was really well paid at the very beginning of her career. That that's one a, time she she did a lot of charity work too, obviously. But it's yeah. a, it's a notable thing and a notable payday because even now in Bellator, you're you may not be at that level yet. You know what I mean? No. Totally. She, I think the title fight was like fifteen thousand dollars or something for me. Okay. Okay. So yeah. yeah. So so yeah, Merlo's um uh, again by, by yeah you know and I'm glad you said that because I I think the same thing you know you you take it when you get it the Japanese were paying it she did beat Becky Levi who was a woman uh you know about 240 pounds kind of thing um yeah. and she beat an even bigger Russian girl as well and uh wow so, so like, yeah I didn't even know that about her so yeah Merlos goes back a long way she I I met her competing in Abu Dhabi uh, when she went to the Abu Dhabi trials as well um so yeah I I know her pretty well I've interviewed her in the same format and stuff mm -hmm. and she's a definitely uh yeah goes Legend. down as yeah for sure I'm uh, for sure now yeah. uh you win the title and that's the inaugural featherweight title so you're the first 145 pound world champion in women's MMA on a big show you know, yeah. we, uh, the UFC hasn't been doing that yet and that sort of stuff. How did that feel? Did, did you feel, you know, aside yeah. from her, did, did she give the party room to you? Did she <laughs> did she put the oh, bill yeah. to your party? Yeah. How did no, that go down? It was uh, nothing but respect afterwards, for sure. And um, it felt like a huge accomplishment for me. I was like, it, uh, at that point, I was like, when I, when I won the belt, it was... I was like, it wasn't uncomfortable, but I was like, oh my God, like this crazy. Like, it was like, I, I was like, okay, do I, did I really earn this? Do I really like, until I defended the belt, I was like, okay, now this is mine. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't feel like that right when I first won it. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now that first defense comes uh, about eight months later and they bring Arlene back. And mm -hmm. now the Arlene match right before Merlo's. You did win it, but this was the the return from injury. It was a majority yeah. decision. Um, so obviously she comes in motivated to beat you. You now have the championship belt. She's getting her rematch. She wants to get her win, uh, you know, win <laughs> over you. Um, and this is the one that you, for you in your head solidified the championship. So talk about Bellator one eighty nine and, and the rematch with Arlene. I think I was just like for this one. Um... I wasn't that pumped on it because I bought her like a year before and I was like, I wanted a new, I, I wanted a new uh, opponent, but I was like, whatever, this is the only fight that they could get me if I wanted to fight this year um, in 2017. And I was like, let's do it. Uh, and it was, um, it was tough because uh, like, I think I was just at that training camp was just really hard. Like, I don't think I was, I don't didn't know if I was injured for this camp as well, but I was just like a tough, I just remember the training camp being like, not, yeah, not that pump, pump to be fighting. It was, okay. it was not, it, not as motivated as I was for my, my, my next fights coming up. So. Okay. Now with the, yeah. with the title in hand, not be more, were you overtrained? Would, would that be, you know, you're an athlete, you know what that means. Would, I, would, you, would you consider that the factor? I think so because I don't know if I was supposed to fight in the June, like right um, after my title, my, 
after I won the title, I think I was, I had trained for a camp or like for a camp and a fight that I thought was going to happen in, in the summer. And then I, I think I was kind of disappointed from that. And then this fight, uh, came together really quick like I don't know if it was like five or six weeks or whatever and they were like okay you're fighting Arlene and I think I just wasn't that pumped because I was like I already beat her I just beat her like give me somebody new there was other girls in the division nobody was ready to go and I was like I want to fight so I took it but I probably was like half-hearted if that makes sense okay okay that's that's okay that's okay yeah. but you're you're on a huge win streak uh, and uh, yeah. you kept it going there. It was a split decision. You did go the full mm-hmm. five rounds. So mm-hmm. um, you, you felt yeah. like, you know, a lot yeah. of people say that. It's an old saying where you're not the champion until you've defended the belt, you know. Yeah. Um, so here you got your first defense. And, and then the next time you wanted a challenge, they bring in that uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu champion who, who was undefeated that had fallen out of the fight. And that's Toledo Nogueira. Yeah. Yeah. What do you remember about this at Bellator 2000? Uh, I'm sorry, 202, 202. Um, yeah, like I was pumped for this one because I was like, I wasn't that happy with my performance this uh, against Arlene. I was like, I, I was like, uh, I, I, I was just like, I wasn't that happy with it. So I think it was a split decision. Wasn't that happy about it. But then I went in super motivated for um, that fight against Talita. Plus she was like, I trained for an entire camp earlier she was supposed to be my first fight in Bellator. So I felt like I kind of knew her and knew her style. And I was excited about fighting like a, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world champion and like putting my grappling and wrestling to the test there. So, um, yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah. But good, you gotta, good. you gotta win. You stopped during the third round. So you didn't, you didn't go the distance. You, you, you got the job done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. What, what was she like? Um, she was strong, but she was really, she was, she had a very strange striking style. I remember being like, Oh, like in the first, first round, I was like, okay, this is really weird. Like punches from weird angles, switching her stance, Southpaw orthodox. I remember being like, Oh, this is, this is a bit strange. Never saw her fight like that before, but I started to pick her apart on my feet and then, yeah, I was able to implement my game plan. So. Okay, good, good. So now you've defended the belt. They yeah. bring you back. Uh, uh, it takes a year for you to get back yeah. here. What, what, what's going on with Bellator? Is it just, you know, I always just, thought that, you know, Bellator was at this point kind of firmly second. They weren't going to catch a UFC. And one of the problems for me is that the UFC had worked out a situation where if you're on a pay-per-view and then if you're not on a pay-per-view the next week, you're on Spike TV. And then they had Fox Sports. And then, they, you know, they had outlets for weekly shows, whereas Bellator mm-hmm. was on Paramount. And Paramount would be like, yeah, you're going to have three shows in three weeks and then take two months off because of our TV schedule. So what yeah. happened here that you had a year uh, between fights? And, you know, you main evented uh, these last yeah. shows. You were the actual top fight. There was no men above you or anything like that. So why wait a year? I don't for know. fighting I'm Olga Rubin. Pissed off. I was super pissed off. I was like, I want to fight. Um, they were like, there's no one for you to fight. Okay. Right? We got to build some of the girls up. No one for you to fight. Um, the next, like the next girl I fought ended up getting like a win or two or two finishes or two wins or something. And then um, they were ready to bring me in with her. But I remember just being pissed off because I wanted to be active. I wanted to be, um, I wanted to fight like, yeah. and so the year off, but I, I, uh, I tr- like that I'd made, yeah, it was an, aw- that was an awesome fight for me and just like it felt like everything came together in that camp and then i was able to showcase it on fight night so this is olga rubin and uh you took her mm-hmm. out in the first round so at this point you've defended the belt a handful of times um mm-hmm. that's your 11th win in a row if i'm not mistaken right you have an 11 fight winning streak in there and now yeah. comes and one of the things i was going to mention to you it's one of those things you know, we, we talked about you fighting in Kansas City. Now, this is Thackerville, Oklahoma, which is probably a, a little bit. Yes. If, if Kansas City would be a B venue, this might be C or D because it's definitely smaller. Although I hear it's a very nice casino. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I was pissed. I, I remember being like, can I go on like any, like, I never in my mind did I want to go to the Windstar five times in my <laughs> Like, you know, I'm like, holy crap. So. 
I remember joking after a while. It just was like, let me guess. I'm fighting at the Windstar. And it was, yep, you're fighting at the Windstar. Okay. Um, but hey, it, it was good. It had good feeling. I, I won all my fights there. And it was, yeah. It was good. Yeah. But now, now, Bellator does the right thing here at 238. You, you do take six months off, which is, you know, really. It's okay for a champion. It's proper in MMA. That's mm -hmm. really, you know, now you're getting sort of championship treatment. They bring, they bring you back and they're building up a fight. And now you're going to go to Inglewood, California, which is outside yeah. of LA. And uh, we've been talking a lot of big names, you know, from Merlos to Ronda to, uh, you know, uh, some of the other names we talked about, uh, uh, Gina and blah, blah, blah. And now here is Chris Cyborg. Chris, Chris, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Justino, or she she used to have her husband's name before that, but uh, Chris Cyborg. Yeah. Talk about the, uh, Cyborg because a lot of people think she may be the GOAT. Yeah. Um. I mean, yeah, it was that was crazy. Like, obviously, going from the Windstar, 3,000 people to um, a sold out. I think we sold out the forum. That's awesome. So that was. I remember just the feeling, the electric feeling in there. And um, we literally like, we, yeah, it was, it was a, that was a big, like, I remember walking out and having no idea like what it was like to fight in front of a crowd that, that big. And um, it was one of my, even though I lost that fight, it's one of my favorite experiences in my career for sure. Okay. You went to the fourth round with her, which, uh, you know, she's, a handful. Not a lot of people could say mm -hmm. that they were going to take her into the fourth round. Talk about the actual nuances of the fight. Did you at some point feel like it was slipping away from you, or did you at some point think you yeah. feel like you had yeah. her? How how, how was the, well, the ebb and flow? I so I think I won the first round, and I was wow. doing uh, I was doing, uh, uh, but I I remember I like I could feel like so certain techniques and stuff like I'd get my underhook and it was like she just she would get my she'd get her underhook back like so it was like it felt like it was like literally like a a game of inches in that first and I remember I was working really hard and I just in the second round I was like okay like trying to get my heart rate down slow it down between the first and the second round and it was just like it was it was like this it was like fighting somebody that just knew what I was going to do. And she was, she was calmer than I was. Like she kept it cool. And I think I was just like, I was hyper and I was like, I gassed myself out a little bit in the third round. And then um, I think the fight either ended in the third round or the fourth round, yeah, but I was just round. like, I feel it slipping away because I was just like going kind of crazy. It was like, I wasn't keeping myself really calm, cool and collected. And I was, um, and then she was just such, she's a, such a veteran and like really uh, she's freaking good. Like she is good. Yeah. Okay. So I got to give it to her. I was really pissed off after the fight, but I was like, you know what? I got to give it to her. Cause I knew in the certain moments in the fight where she was just like, she was beating me two positions and yeah. Anyways. <laughs> okay. Okay. And that's okay. You know, you, you, you've lost it. Your losses at this point are only two top people. So yeah. Uh, you know, she definitely qualifies as one of those, so uh, you you shouldn't be ashamed. But and you, yeah. into the fourth round is good. Now, let me ask you some touchy questions. Yeah. Um, steroids. Did you feel mm -hmm. like you were fighting somebody on steroids? Well, it was frustrating because um, we asked for drug testing before that fight in California, and she went to South Africa, and they were like, "We can't test her over here. Like, we don't can't test her." We can test when she comes back, but she kind of like disappeared to South Africa for the whole camp. Wow. And I remember being like, Hey, like that, I remember that bothering me in the, in the lead up to it. But either way, it was like, like, do you still want to fight or not? Like, and, um, I did like, I was like, whatever it is, it is what it is. Um, and so, yeah, she was gone. So I remember talking to the, uh california athletic commission was calling us because they were supposed to be like checking on us and stuff and they were like she's not in california so we're just not like we're not able to do the testing so i wow. kind of just had to let go beforehand but yeah okay i mean it is it is what it is <laughs> and you know I, I, I unfortunately at the top level of the pro game 
it's it's always a potential possibility, you know. And with her, yeah. there's been the open question. Did did she feel? You, you know, you're a very fit woman and and very powerful as well. Mm-hmm. But did she feel stronger than you, did, or were you okay in that that respect? It it wasn't that. It was the uh, it was like the recovery. It was like how quickly she was able to like. It was that I don't know. It was like it was like other things. So I was like, holy, like how does she have that? Because in some of her fights in UFC, um, you saw her kind of dwindle, like or like her energy levels going down. And she, every round was like, not even breathing heavy when she'd come out to each round after that. So I think it was that it was like, a, it was more so like a conditioning aspect, okay. but again, she had moved her camp to South Africa at altitude, blah, blah, blah. Not sure. Um, so I what mean, happened to, what happened to big bear? <laughs> you know, big yeah. bears out, you know, <laughs> South Africa. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But I, hey, it, like, you gotta, you gotta, I don't want to use that as an excuse because there was like moments in that fight that I was like, I, it definitely didn't feel like it was a strength thing. I can say that. So okay. I don't want, hey. I don't want to say that because I don't want to accuse her of that if that wasn't the case thing. So, okay. And, and that's fair. That's fair. Other people yeah. have, you know, so, but uh, I, I think you approach it with a lot of class there. And, and the fact is, is Go to South Africa. It, you know, South Africa is not a mecca for MMA training or anything like that. Yes, there's mm-hmm. altitude. There's other options and things. Um, so, you know, the question remains. We'll never know, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, I, I don't recall noticing in the fight, but stature-wise, is she bigger than you? Like, Because it, it, she's a very big woman. I've seen her like next to like UFC champion Frankie Edgar, and she's a lot bigger than him. How How... How did the, the physical matchup seem, or did she seem like... Because she sometimes even struggled to make 145. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't feel that. I didn't feel that much smaller than her. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So you come back to Bellator and you reel off two more wins. Were Were you working for a rematch with Cyborg? Is that something that was in the back of your head? Did you want your belt back? Yeah. And that was kind of one of the deciding factors of not signing with them again and trying PFL was like, I wanted a guarantee. And I, I remember Cyborg was saying like, she doesn't want rematches. She wants new fights, blah, blah, blah. blah. And I was like listening to a lot of um, what uh, Bellator wasn't going to guarantee me a, a rematch. And um, so PFL was offering the season at 155. Okay. So I was like, you know what? I might as well try. I spent, I think like seven years with, yeah, I was with Bellator for seven years at the time. And um I was ready for a change. Okay. And that, that's fair. So we after the cyborg fight, you did fight uh, Jesse Mealy and Diana Silva for Bellator. Both yeah. wins. So you were trying to work your way back. They weren't mm-hmm. offering the title fight. And then you did go to the PFL. Um, now, in yeah. the PFL, you made your debut at PFL 10 uh, against Caitlin Young. Was this part of one of their tournaments? Just a showcase fight. Yeah. So that was showcase fight at 155. Uh, great fight, and then the next year I started in the in the season. Okay, and here they had uh, Harrison, the the wrestler yeah. who won all those tournaments and stuff, and that would pose the challenge there for you that you would have been working for. Um, what yeah. happened in your PFL three uh, in two thousand twenty two, uh, the debut against uh, uh, Gina Fabian? This was part of the tournament. Mm-hmm. It was part of the tournament. Um, she didn't. Uh, I don't even think she weighed in, but she weighed in at like 161, 162. And I was like, I was coming up from 45. I think I was like, didn't even cut weight to fight at 55. And she was just massive. Like uh, she was massive. I think they told me she was walking around at like 181. Wow. So my technique, she's a kickboxer. I was like, okay, I'm uh, my, my whole game plan was like, wrestling get her on the ground get her on her back beat her up and i remember shooting in and i lifted her up and her feet were still on the ground (laughs) and i was like okay and then i was like whoa like her stature i there's a picture of her next to ray sefo she's like towering over him oh gosh i was like oh my god so i think it was just kind of like that was I, i fought to a decision i ended up breaking my orbital in the um it was like a, I think the first or second round, my I broke my orbital and I was like, okay, this is that felt weird, right? Fight mm-hmm. through it. 
fight the fight, lose the decision. I was like really pissed off. But right away, you're like, oh, you're fighting Kayla Harrison next. So I go into camp to start training and I'm like, uh, something's wrong. Like my, I, every time, so I got one of those like nose protector headgears and literally I could feel my face shifting and moving when I'd like, even if like something like lightly grazed me, I was like, this isn't right. Then we got our, uh, um, I think it was like a CT scan or something. And it was like, okay, you have a broken orbital. I had to pull out of that fight. So the orbital, up, the, the orbital break wasn't discovered by the PFL doctors or anything like that? No. Okay. No. That, that's, so, a, that's a dangerous injury, too, though, because, it, you, it, you know. It, it, it was, and I was like, I could just tell, like, uh, under my eye, like, I, I could kind of tell something was wrong. Because so I was like, this is just weird. Like, it shouldn't hurt that much. And every time that I would, um, like, literally, it was like something like, even if Lance hit the pad in my hand was here I could feel it shifting on the other side and so then I ended up breaking my orbital and I'm like so pissed off that was like my first season I was like planning on um I went almost through the whole camp trying to work around my face and then when I found out it was broken I had to pull out of that fight and then I got the opportunity to fight Aspen Ladd in Madison Square Garden at the end of the year and I won that fight and the judges gave it to Aspen. It was, I lost a split decision, but okay. I was like, so off. I was like, Oh my God. Um, I felt like I really won that fight. Lost the first round, won the second and third, in my opinion. And um, anyways, so it, it does go down yeah. as a split decision. Now, how was uh, the Madison square garden experience in New York and the whole thing? It was awesome. It was so awesome. It was just like a dream come true to be fighting there it wasn't the actual Madison Square Garden. It's like the smaller venue right beside it. Uh, but the, still, the Kodak Theater, I think. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah, something like that. And it was still. It, it, it used to. I, I grew up in New York. It used to be called the Felt Forum. So I okay. know it's not Felt Forum anymore, but it's like a five thousand seater next to it. But still, yeah, it, it is on yeah. Broadway. <laughs> yes, super cool venue. Um, and then so then that one I lose a split decision and. I was now, just like, oh, man. Now, let me ask you, you know, because at this point, you've paid your dues. You know, you've been through the kickboxing start. You've gone through a Bellator <laughs> run that was fantastic. Um, you know, um, you've been a world champion. You defended the world championships and stuff. You go to the PFL with high hopes. They're dangling a million dollars at the end of this tournament. And now, you know, it's kind of like, you are you getting, you feeling a little cheated out of it? And, and, you know, the financial compensation is really the big thing here. Um, so what was your motivation there? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I wanted to do that. I also wanted, I, what I liked about that, that format is that like, you know, you're fighting, you're getting like a minimum of two fights close to each other. And then the potential of four fights. So I was like, uh, that was what was really exciting for me because I had come from Bellator where I was fighting like once a year. And right. so that was really exciting, the thought of that. And then after, after I lost the split decision to Aspen, um, I, I found out they were fighting the next uh, season was going to be at 145. And um, yeah, so I was pretty excited. to. I went into the 2023 season i um, excited about that, that it was at 145. I'm like, that's good because this is really my weight class. Sure. And um, and then uh, I fought Larissa, Larissa Pacheco. Pacheco. Yep. Yeah. Their champ uh, was my first draw last year. And I that was a hell of a fight. Again, I thought I won that fight. I ended up losing, but it was like everybody came up to me afterwards and was like, I thought you won that fight. Like people were booing. It was insane. And um I thought I won it, but again, I'm obviously biased, but I was like trying, I watched it as like, just kind of watched it as it, like a, trying to see what I thought. And I was like, I won 11 of 15 minutes, but she wow. comes out. Yeah. But she's a, she was aggressive. And um, I just learned, like I made a couple mistakes towards the end of the rounds that she was ending up in, in dumb position. So I was like, uh, it didn't feel like a loss, but I was like, um, took away a lot from that. And then, uh, I was fighting again eight weeks later and, and I fought Jindrova and ended up winning. So, yeah. um, last year, last year was definitely a better year with PFL. And then I was supposed to fight Kate or Kayla Harrison 
in at the finals in um, a showcase fight in November, and Aspen ended up fighting um, her instead. So okay, yeah. okay. So then now we Pacheco. So you, you you're saying the factor there was like she she was basically winning the last minute of the round and and kind of notching the round with the judges. Yeah, I think so. And I was like, you know what? I, I can. I'm like, she was the champ. It was all like it was. You know, she's she's tough. Like, don't get me wrong, she's tough. She, tons of finishes. I think that it was kind of. Um, I shocked her. I was I rocked her in the first round and took her down and had like some amazing moments in that fight. But again, I was like, you know what? It is what it is, and I I had a lot of fun. It was a good experience. And then I knew that I was got to fight again uh, eight weeks later. So yeah, I was you, like, you fought the, the Martina Jindrova <laughs> fight. You got back on the winning streak. Yeah. To compare PFL to Bellator in terms of size and uh, care for the fighters, the, the, just the whole thing, the, the production and everything. Is it on par with Bellator or is it uh, a little bit better? Um, feeling fighting there? Does it feel like a bigger show no. or does it feel the for same? Bellator is. Bellator is like a well the Bellator before now it's all the same organization like sure, right. PFL, Bellator but with Bellator there's like certain people behind the scenes that always feel it does it always felt like a family so like they've got Jane they got Carrie um, Rich uh, Mike they that like little unit and everybody else too but um, it just feels like a family when you go in there to check in and do the paperwork and all that stuff it feels a little bit more um uh yeah anyways yeah, like they, when they, I, they take care for you they have a personal yeah touch. yeah um pfl was very like it's uh, i understand that it's um it's about this tournament like in this or season i should say they don't want to call it a season and this million dollar uh paycheck but it's very uh i don't know i don't know it doesn't feel as like it's, it's more cold. corporate yeah, it's more yeah, corporate. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. So now are you uh you 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 went out with a win that was in June of 2023. Mm -hmm. Are you still under the PFL contract? Are you expecting a fight no. this year? I am. I'm expecting uh I'm we're waiting to hear. There's a bunch of 145 pound fights in June, and we just keep talking to Mike Kogan. Um and because the they got rid of the 145 girls. For the season so pfl doesn't have uh the 145ers in it anymore um so it's all with bellator so we're just contacting them and just waiting to hear hopefully um i mean i don't want anyone to get injured but hopefully there's like an injury replacement that i can step in for or find out if i'm fighting later this year for them okay now let me ask you are you do you have a contract that obligates you to stay with them or is the UFC an no, option at this point? UFC is not an option. Cause I don't, I don't, uh, I can't make 135. I'm just, okay. I, I, yeah. I'm now they, 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 they done 145 for a little while. Did they sunset that again? They stopped it. Uh, basically when Amanda retired, I think they kind of just uh, stopped the 45 division I don't know if they'd ever start it again, but yeah, it would be an option for sure if they start it again. Okay. So you would contractually yeah. be able to, the, the contract's yeah. at least flexible that way. Yeah, totally. And then maybe if, depending on how long this takes, we obviously um, just keeping it open for Bellator uh, for MMA, but maybe doing some boxing, uh, unified boxing in Canada um, has a big card on May 24th, but um, their later one this year, maybe I'll, I'll be in on that. Okay, cool. So you're still still mm -hmm. in the game, still active, and uh, it's rare yeah. we get to deal and uh, talk to an active fighter because it's more the MMA museum. You know, we talked more yeah. retired people, but it's definitely been a pleasure to get to meet you. Um, you too. The, the fact that you're a, uh, a, a a competitor comes across from the beginning of the conversation that that you you were made <laughs> for this stuff. You know, you're definitely. I, I've watched you fight. Um, and you have a, a, a nice style. It shows you're a total pro. And, um, you you know, thinking back on it, talking back on it, you've got great perspective and great uh, information that we got about the fights and about what made you a champion. It, it kind of comes across in the, in, the, uh, in the interview for sure. Um, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the family that you 
literally, you know, people say, oh, they come from a fighting family. Now, you are a fighting family, huh? Because you've got yeah. Lance, obviously, <laughs> who we've interviewed. Um, I'd like to interview your son at some point. We're going to see if we can line that up. But talk a little bit about Junior and Junior's career. And, and do you guys train together now? Because I know, you know, obviously, um, Lance had told me that he's been in the fight game carrying buckets since he was like three years old kind of thing. Yeah. So he yeah, was born to do this too. His first fight for when he was like four or five years old, like he was in the corner of one of our fighters. Um, yeah, we trained together. He has helped me immensely, like with my, uh, especially with my wrestling. And um, he fought for Bellator as well. So that was really cool when we were both fighting for them. We even fought the same night, one night in uh, New York. I think that almost gave Lance Sr. a heart attack having both of us fighting. And, but I <laughs> Hey, you know, we had to do it at least once to see, um, yeah, if it was something that we could do. That's and, cool. But right now he's fighting May 25th um, down in Washington. Uh, and yeah, he's just, he's, he's, he's amazing. He's really talented. So. Yes. And I thought for sure with him being a, a 55er and, you know, mm -hmm. closer to your weight class, it, it probably suits you for training and, and getting a feel yeah. for it as, as opposed to Lance. Who totally. you know, <laughs> yeah, who was big and stuff, you know what yeah. I mean? So yeah, that, that's a good deal. So I'm gonna ask you as a final question here as we're wrapping up. Yeah. A, a question I forgot to ask Lance. Okay. Has this happened yet? Because you know, you've got the uh, junior, uh, Lance Jr. Has he gotten to the point where he can beat Lance Sr. yet? Or is Lance Sr. still <laughs> holding his own? Is that day coming to gym where Lance was like, All right, he's better than me now? T tell us your perspective uh on that. It hasn't come in the gym, but uh, we always crack up because Lance Senior has so many tricks up his sleeve. We're like, "Oh, you never showed us that!" And I'm like, "Whenever <laughs> we meet and train with him, he's just, uh, yeah, he's hilarious." But um, no, no, they've okay. never, they've never done that. They've um, never done that. Okay. It's always, it, and it's always funny when there is like when they are grappling. He always just like Lance Senior like attacks the heels and, and feet right away so we were joking we're like oh this is he's like hey you want to just like uh grapple lightly whatever and then he'll like roll back and and have junior and heel hook right away and we're like we're like yeah. oh nice one you know <laughs> yeah no <laughs> lance has got that that uh you know he's a, he's obviously a great persona and stuff and he's you know with his x-men appearance i didn't even realize he was a movie star you know what i mean but um uh he's a he's a savvy like fountain of knowledge yeah. in this sport. He's been around since the very beginning and stuff like that. So uh, for sure. But I, sometimes that, that rite of passage from this younger generation to the older generation happens, but the old guys are very grudging to give it up. They, he won't give oh, it up. Yeah. I didn't think Lance would. No, <laughs> so. no, he doesn't. And he's always got their best mentality. Cause like he, that is somebody that loves to fight. Like he, and it's just like, it's just like a raw, like it's something that he brings. that's like, you know, I feel like me and junior both think a lot and like, Oh, strategize and this and that. And then there's Lance seniors very smart, but he also just has this like side to him. That's like, he's a killer. So it's like, there's this very raw, like fighter aspect to him that I think is an important um, part to bring to the game. Cause that's what it is at the end of the day. It's a fight. So yeah. 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 The, the instinct part, if not, you, you know, yeah. I, I, We'll wrap it up with an old saying from Jack Dempsey, the 1920s boxer, where he said, you know, while you're thinking about it, I'm punching you in the face, you know, yeah. so <laughs> so for sure. Yeah. Julia, it's been a great interview. We've gone about an hour and 40 minutes, which is, is pretty long. So I'm very grateful for the okay. amount of time I could spend another hour or two talking to you if if, uh, if uh, you let me. But I'm going to let you go. Um, OK, thank you. I heard you guys are building a house. You have a beautiful home there already. You're getting another one. We are. We we kind of moved out of the city, um, and so yeah, we're we've uh, we're selling our home in the city right now and moving up to the Sunshine Coast. So cool, cool. Yeah, I heard about yeah. you guys have an organic farm and you're trying to yeah. do all your stuff there and stuff. So it's a great story. Um, you guys uh, <laughs> have a spectacular life. You had a spectacular career, and uh, I've been grateful to meet you. Thank you very much. I'm Miguel, yeah, from the Thank MMA you so Museum. Much. Cool. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Bye, bye.